It's so good to be with you. We've uh, been in Florida now for what, 35, 36 years down in Merritt Island. Before that, I was uh, on the staff with Pastor Chuck at Costa Mesa for about seven and a half years. Before that, uh, we lived in England. I was part of a duo called Malcolm and Alwyn. We toured America. That's how we first came to America. And I first came to Calvary Chapel, uh, Costa Mesa, to a Saturday night concert. That's how I got to be in America. But I am originally from England. That's why you talk funny. <laughs> but I, uh, I love to teach the word and so blessed, privileged that you invited us to come. Thank you so much. Psalm I'd like to share with you is the Psalm 61. And it is especially dear to me. I'm just going to do verses 1 through 4. I'm going to explain to you later why this psalm is particularly dear to me. And we're going to start then by reading the scriptures there. It it says it's a uh, psalm to the chief musician on stringed instrument, a psalm of David. A psalm of David, one of David's psalms. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on it first, shall we? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we, uh, we have scriptures preserved through the centuries and given to us to open today God's word. So bless it too as we pray. May our hearts be open to the spirit of God to speak into our heart and life and use this psalm in our heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. And I will abide in your tabernacle forever. And I will trust in the shelter of your wings. You know, David, of course, had his share of glory. I'm sure that you all know that it's likely that he came to prominence as a young man. Some say, well, I was kind of looking this up at different people and how old they think David was. And uh, around 15 to 16 years old, others have him 20 to 21 years old. All I know is he's between 13 and 21 when he slayed Goliath. Don't know his exact age. Later, of course, receiving the adulation of the masses, especially the young women. And even as a young man, he was called and anointed to be king over Israel. When he finally came into his reign, it was a glorious, prosperous one that laid the foundation that his son Solomon built upon, which brought Israel to her apex the apex of her glory. Now a superficial look at David's life would lead us to believe that it was a wonderful, exciting adventure that brought him all that a man could desire. But you don't have to be a a great student of the Bible to know that David had his share of problems, difficulties. In fact, as well as glory, we could say that We could just as easily say that his life was one long heartache filled with tragedy, disappointment, and pain. David's story is the sort of perfect example of the dichotomy of life where with its sweet and bitter experiences. You know, live long enough and you'll know that life is sort of a fascinating mixture of joy and pain. It has its thrills, excitement, and glory, but it's not without heartache, even heartbreaks and suffering for for everyone. Even for those born in the most fortunate of of circumstances, you can be a princess and live a miserable life. So they say, there's a couple of princesses, a princess kind of saying that right now, I guess. We won't talk about her and him. Gonna save the queen, that's what I say. 
I love Queen Elizabeth. She loves the Lord and she's been an awesome queen. But you can, of course, even in circumstances that are privileged, nobody escapes life's difficulties and downers. And David had his share. As a young man, while he was still a young man, he was chased by a jealous King Saul. He said like a partridge. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 26 where there it says, So now do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. So this is no fault of his own. He suffered rejection from someone he greatly respected and admired. It's difficult for a young person to understand such things. It brings great heartache. You don't have to be well worn to know pain. And I wonder if some of the young folks here or some of you watching online, if you've known great hurt, maybe like David, perhaps you barely out of your teens. It's extremely painful to be hurt by those who are supposed to know better. And what's the great King Saul of Israel, what's he doing letting his heart be gripped by jealousy so much that he chases this young man through the mountains of Israel to kill him? This is not the way for a mature, older adult to behave. But you see, that's how young folks can get hurt. They often get hurt in this way as those who should know better do things that they shouldn't do. And often through no fault of their own, they become uh, victims of the adult world as they are hounded from one emotional hiding place to another in an endeavor to escape the grown-up madness. Her name was Sharon. She was around 16, 17 years old. She was being abused. At home. We were leading worship with my band at the Keswick Convention there in England where Pastor Chuck was teaching. They didn't really want to start, I don't know if you know anything about the Keswick Convention, but they're a little, you know, stiff upper lip kind of people, little stuff shirt kind of guys. It's amazing they actually invited Pastor Chuck. Well, he wanted us to lead worship, so they allowed us to do one song in the actual meeting. But Chuck, he, he, uh, he takes liberties. <laughs> he did. He took liberty. He said, he got up there, and, and it was mostly, he was speaking to mostly young people. A tent, it was a tent there in beautiful Keswick in the Lake District, and uh, places filled with young folks. And he said, I tell you what you do. This is before he starts preaching. Next night tomorrow night he said come back early i'll let malcolm and his band they'll come out and they'll do some music and lead worship and so uh, he got as a concert every night before the major before the meeting started i get i get the organizers probably weren't too happy but uh we would do a little concert before the main sessions and sharon came hard-faced critical living a radical life twisted inside just a you could see it on her face. You would think that she was a pretty young girl, but she wasn't. She looked uh, terrible in her features, not trusting anyone. But she came back, and she came back again. And each time, one of the guys in the band had talked to her about the Lord. Well, on the last night of the Keswick meetings, she came back, but her countenance had totally changed. We, we actually saw the difference. It was almost like she was glowing. We saw the difference from 24 hours earlier. You see, she'd gone home and she'd given her life to Jesus. And she was glowing. It made such an impact upon us. We wrote a song about her. So, but uh, that was Sharon, a young person being abused. But Jesus met her, you see. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer from the ends of the earth, I will cry to you. 
when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. She found the rock, Jesus Christ. And you don't have to be old to be hurt. You can be overwhelmed at any age. You just look at the statistics of teenage suicide. You can never be too young to need a savior. You can never be too young to be led to the rock. So that's David as a young man. Let's look at David as a married man. David had his share of marital problems. And he experienced the painful rejection from his first wife, Michal. Michal was uh, Saul's daughter, King Saul's daughter. Uh, Saul actually offered her to anyone, I'm sure she didn't like it, but who would kill 100 Philistines for him. You read about it in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 18. So, but she loved David, and David went out and killed 100 Philistines and did other stuff, but... uh, you know the story, right? And they were wed. And as I say, it seems that she loved David, but later, she did not appear to be the kind of woman that would give her support and her and encouragement to her husband. In fact, we learn that she despised him in her heart and reveled in cutting him down. Second Samuel chapter six, verse fourteen. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a a linen ephod. And so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting, with the sound of trumpet. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. So at the height of David's reign, he accomplished something that was one of his greatest desires. The greatest desire of his heart. He he brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And as he was coming back into the city with the Ark, he was so elated that he took off his kingly robes and he, he got down with the people and praised the Lord. I mean, literally, he got down. He was so excited, he whirled around and around with all of his might and danced for joy and everybody was excited. The air was filled with a sort of a festive celebration. Everybody's just having a wonderful time except the wife. She watched from the window and despised him in her heart. And he came home and instead of being met with enthusiasm and encouragement from a supportive wife, he was met with a bucket of cold water, as it were. Well, well, didn't the king look cute today, dressed like a commoner, behaving like a ruffian? Hey, listen, lady, God made me king instead of your dad. And if I want to play my music before the Lord, I will, and you ain't seen nothing yet. (laughs) That's my paraphrase Read something like that. But the hurt was so great, the scars ran so deep, that after this incident, it seems they never really slept together again and their marital problems was never healed and she never bore David any children. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Marital problems can be overwhelming. You've tried so hard. But your spouse just doesn't love the Lord like you do. It's so hard, the insensitivity, the cutting remarks, the put-downs. Perhaps your husband just won't come with you to church. and He ridicules you for it. Or your wife, maybe she thinks you've just gone too far. She despises your open love for God. She despises you. You don't know what to do. And then there are those who are sort of taken up with some other man or he's found another woman and you're afraid that you, you're going to lose the kids. You feel absolutely helpless and overwhelmed. David prayed, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock. 
You see, David had his share of marital problems and family problems. He married again and again and had several wives. And with the multiplicity of wives and the children that they bore came tremendous household turmoil. The children of different marriages vying for power and attention brought horrendous problems to the house of David. One of his young sons, Amnon, by one marriage, raped Tamar, a daughter from another marriage, and then was murdered by her brother, Absalom. Trying to raise children could be immensely overwhelming. So David, as a father, and uh, it can kind of get away from you. It got away from David. He wasn't the best of fathers. He was a father. He fathered children, but he was never really a dad. Ephesians 6 verse 4 says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Nurture admonition in both what I say and what I do. I can lay a strong spiritual foundation in their lives. As in Deuteronomy it says, You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, teaching the word and the precepts and concepts of God's word to your children. That tells me that I'm to teach God's word and God's ways diligently to my children in everyday situations and circumstances. And dads, there's nothing better in the whole world than teaching your children about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, you may feel it's important to send your kids to college. I, I know that's a, a sort of a very American kind of a... In England, it's not so much, but here people go to a lot of expense and difficult trouble or whatever to, to send their children to college and bless you for it. And the sacrifices you make to do that, it's a good thing. But teaching them the ways of God is better than any college education. Or hefty trust fund. <laughs> there's nothing better you can give. And there's nothing better, dads, than a relationship with God. It's not enough to talk, though. You know, they take their cues from you. Your values will become their values. Most of what is taught it's caught, and you are their model. They know what's important to your dad. Work or worship, pleasure or purity, Bible or worldly pursuit, spiritual things or material things. What people think or what God thinks. You're on a stage, you see, and they watch. You model life. You teach. You're all teaching something. So you love God. Love your wife. Love them. That they might themselves love. They might know that they're accepted and they might accept others. Give them that spiritual foundation that they could build upon. I, I haven't always done it right. Hope my kids forgive me the times that I've failed them. Perhaps you've not always done it right. Perhaps you had a father who didn't do it right. Perhaps you had or you have a father who wasn't or isn't a dad. Well, you know, God can do miracles. And I say to you today, if you are one of those people who sadly are estranged from a son or a son estranged from a father or daughter, don't let it go on. Time is precious. When it's gone, it's gone and you can never bring it back. And yes, it can be overwhelming to be a parent. And perhaps you are overwhelmed by it all today and you need to be led to the rock. David said, from the ends of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. So David is a young man. David is a married man and David is a father. David is an older man. 
See, heartache just doesn't come to the young or to those in the midst of life's battles. The elderly, too, have their share of pain. And it can be especially hard when you feel you just have no strength left to fight back. The loneliness. The feelings that no one really cares now that you're old. It is thought that Psalm 61 was written by David at such a time as what we just said. In the twilight years of his life, David had to face what could be described as his most heartbreaking experience, open defiance and violent rebellion from his own son, Absalom. It must have been trying for a young David to be chased around in Gedi by an enraged, crazy King Saul. But it is an older man to be exiled from Jerusalem by an ambitious and bitter son whom he loved must have been almost too much for him to bear. Few people have had the domestic sorrow that David had. Selfish ambition seemed to characterize most of David's sons, Amnon, Rapin, Tamar. The conflict with Absalom, later the rebellious Adonijah, who, while David was still alive and Solomon appointed as his successor, Adonijah declares himself king. It's hard to have people turn against you, but tragic when it's your own family. It's overwhelming, in fact. No wonder David cried, him I cry, O oh God, when my heart is overwhelmed. Driven from home by his own son, who is hunting him down to take his life, he fled to the other side of Jordan. In his mind, it's the ends of the earth. It's from the ends of the earth, I'll cry to you. That's what it felt like to him. You see, he belongs in Jerusalem. <clears throat> but he knows that even though he feels he's at the end of the earth. He can still cry to the Lord and the Lord will hear him. Him I cry. And his problems have brought him to his knees. And, and that's one of the, one of the blessings or, or what happens when we find our heart overwhelmed. We go to the Lord, don't we? It causes us to get on our knees. It's not always a bad place to be. In fact, it's a good place to be wherever he is. David can cry to God. The same is true for you and me. No matter where I am, geographically, God is near. No matter where I am inside, no matter how far I may have even strayed from God, is only a prayer away. No matter how overwhelmed I am, he is still the rock. David said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He recognized that though he was incapable of dealing with the situation that he faced, there was one who is able. You see, there are many things that overwhelm us in life. And we have to come to that place where we recognize we need someone higher than me, higher than I. We need the Lord. I've mentioned just a few things today. A few of those things that actually relate to the psalmist's life, David's life. But what overwhelms you? Anything overwhelm you today? Perhaps you're one of those young people living with the madness of seeing an adult, maybe someone you respect or even mom or dad. Behaving in a manner totally inconsistent with the way things are supposed to be. So many people like that in the world today. Adults ought to know better. Dividing families, dividing nations. Poor examples to our young. Like Saul with David, it's hard for you maybe to cope. Maybe you're running inside because it's all too overwhelming. Maybe it's your marriage. Your spouse has left you. You just don't know what to do. 
She won't listen. She won't see sense and you are overwhelmed. Or is it that you have major problems in your family and you have no way of dealing with it? It's out of hand. A son or a daughter taken to drinking, party, till all hours, or using drugs, and you're overwhelmed by it all. Or is it that someone has turned against you for no other reason than bitterness and resentment, and it's left you lonely and confused, and you're hurt, you're overwhelmed. Well, they're, they're pretty heavy things. There are other things that overwhelm us. Everyday things. Maybe a, a loss of a job. Maybe you're unemployed and, and you just can't find a job. <laughs> These days, it's like they can't find enough people to work. But maybe for you, it's just that you're frustrated because you're not able to work in the line of work that you're skilled in and can't find the right job and... You're frustrated you can't provide for your family. It can be so overwhelming. Being the head of a family, perhaps. And then there is, of course, the most overwhelming experience of all. The loss of a loved one. How that can be so overwhelming. There is no experience like it. It's an experience that leaves you feeling helpless and empty. And to a degree, it, it never goes away. There's a hole there. Can't be filled. You miss them so much. And there's no pain like the pain you're feeling at this time. There's a hole in your heart that nothing and no one can fill. We may take some comfort knowing that our loved one is with the Lord. But that may not take away all the pain that we feel right now. I remember saying to a dear friend of mine, who just lost his wife, his soulmate. We know that she's with the Lord, brother. His reply, yes, but she's not with me. So it stunned me. I don't really say that anymore to anyone. You see, as the scripture says, we do not sorrow as those who have no hope, but the fact remains, we do sorrow. And it is a painful reality of being human. Even Jesus wept at the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus, although he knew he was going to rise again. But I'm a Christian. Surely I ought not to feel this way. Well, can it be that it's because you are a Christian you feel an even deeper sense of loss? It's because of the love, the godly love, that you have for the one you've lost that you hurt so much. And there's surely no deeper love than true Christian love. Whatever it is, it's too big for me. There is one higher than I, the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I have come to the limit of my ability, there is one higher than I. There is one who can come through for me and has come through for me again and again, and does come through for me, is a shelter, a strong tower, someone in whose arms I can abide, someone in whom I can trust, the Lord Jesus. As promised, I, I said I'd tell you why this psalm is so special to me. It took a long time before my mom and dad took my Christianity seriously. Looking back, I can't blame them. <laughs> I was always wanting to do things a little differently. At the age of 17, I joined a rock and roll band. I had crazy clothes and crazy hair. Transcendental meditation was a big thing. That was a biggie for my mom to try and get her head around as I sit there like a vegetable, <laughs> looking at me like, What's up with you? <laughs> My friend Alwyn, we all did it together. Me, Carol, and her sister Gloria, who Alwyn, my best friend, is married to. He's also my brother-in-law. Uh, 
his mom, she gave him the same thing, like, what are you doing? They sit on the bed meditating, and she go to the loo, the bathroom, flush the toilet <laughs> when he's trying to concentrate on his meditation. <laughs> so when I became a Christian, they thought I'd really flipped out completely. Over the years, as I grew in the Lord, they witnessed the consistency of my commitment to the Lord, and it began to make a difference, especially when the Lord brought me to America. And they were able, we lived in California, as I mentioned, for seven and a half years, and my mom and dad were able to visit us in California and see and attend Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa and hear Pastor Chuck teach. It makes a lot of difference when you can take your family to a, a right on church. Thank God for, for this church. There's witness in the community of this fellowship and many others that are like this. You can take your family too, and you're not embarrassed to do so. We weren't able to do that when we lived in England. Mom and dad really didn't like our church. In fact, my mom said to me, why don't you go to a proper church? <laughs> she meant an Anglican church. It was sort of an embarrassment to take anybody there, actually. But they liked Calvary Chapel, and the Lord began a work in their heart. While I was at Costa Mesa, I, I sometimes took minister teams to England. It was on one of those occasions that mom and dad came to hear me speak, and uh, came to watch our band and hear me speak. And as I prayed with the congregation for those who wanted to accept Christ, unknown to me, my mom and dad prayed the prayer. Sometime thereafter, I, I think, pretty much soon after, my mom began to seriously, systematically read the Bible. Of course, I, I was to find this out later. And during that trip, it was the last time that I would see my dad alive. As we said our goodbyes at the garden gate, Lord spoke to Carol and told her that she was saying the goodbye for the last time to my dad. Well, October the 1st, about 38 years ago, there in our little apartment in Santa Ana, I got that phone call that we all dread. I knew something was wrong because it was one of my aunties calling me who never calls. I flew to England on the first available flight and found my mom devastated over the passing of my father. You see, her whole life revolved around him and me, of course. Now he was gone. She didn't know what to do. She was completely and absolutely overwhelmed. And I wasn't much help. I, I couldn't comfort her. Well, she went to bed that night and she opened the word of God, not just at random, like playing Bible roulette, you know. Try to find a place. No, not just at random. But as she was systematically reading through she came to the place where she left off the last time, and this is what she read. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you, and my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. And God himself met her in her deepest need. He spoke to her in a very real way. And she came downstairs the, the next day and came down into the kitchen there with me and she said she told me what had happened. Now, I was absolutely amazed to hear my mother speaking this way. God spoke to me, she said. You've got to understand what kind of a person and what kind of a background we come from. For, for my mother to say that, it's like one of the most radical statements I've ever heard in my life. And she said, God spoke to me. She said, can you believe that, Malcolm? God actually spoke to me. I said, yeah, yeah, he does. And he gave her exactly what she needed. And God had spoken to her. And she told me about the time that I'd preached and how Dad had prayed to accept Christ. And we shared the word of God together. And the Lord gave us 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who've fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So we did. And we took that verse 14, there where it says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. We took that verse 14 and wrote it at the side of Dad's name in that book of remembrance at the crematorium. How glorious to have such promises in God's word. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Brothers and sisters, if you've never yet been overwhelmed in life, you will be. If you've not already, you will one day face something that's just too big for you to cope with. Will you be able to say with David, God is my shelter? Is he? The Lord is my rock. Are you trusting in the shelter of his wings? For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock? Accept our God. Perhaps even today, you're overwhelmed in a congregation like this. I, I would think that there's someone here that God is speaking to right now. He's brought you really here, hoping for something from him. Well, he's here to meet you and to meet with you. But we have to humble ourselves, don't we? Acknowledge that we have a need of the Lord. And even if there's anyone here in this room and watching online that have not yet come to the Lord, sometimes God will use circumstances like this to bring you to know Him. He loves you. If you've not yet committed your life to Jesus Christ, you should do that today. Simple prayer is just a prayer away. You just cry out to Him from your heart. Turn a whole life over to Him.